FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome, and you are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Carrie Lutz. It's 11 13 of 2018. Just a month and a half left till this year concludes and joins the others in history. Well, hey, much has happened, much is happening. Uh, President Trump, we've never seen anything like him, especially on trade. And hey, by the way, join us in the dialogue. Just email us, kl at kerrylutz.com. I'm busy catching up on your emails now. So trade war with China, I prefer to call it an economic war because we've been in one for 30 years now and just haven't realized it or haven't joined it until President Trump came along. Well, now we've got the stories of the Chinese diverting uh, large volumes of internet traffic from Verizon over to China. It's to happened for 30 months. Hard to believe no one, no one could track it. No one knew what was happening, but that is what happened. Well, Jeff Ferry is with us now. Jeff of Coalition for Prosperous America. Welcome back. Hi, Kerry. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. So what's with this China thing now? And it just happens, we just happen to be uh, informed of it right now, which is kind of uh, fortuitous, isn't it? Yes, it's uh, amazing that it went on for so long undetected. But, you know, these things happen in the world of, dare I say it, espionage. Mm. Um, what, what the, you know, we don't, uh, you know, we, what we can tell based on what the internet experts who discover this problem say is the motivation is probably corporate espionage, getting large volumes of internet traffic to go through China where they can be tapped off and copied and then the dissected looking for corporate secrets. That's probably the motive. And, um, you know, espionage works by attacking your enemy somewhere where he doesn't expect it. And um, we didn't expect it here in our domestic Internet. And the reason we didn't is because we've got huge volumes of Internet traffic carried by literally hundreds of different telecom companies. And uh, we don't have a system to police that process. And I'm sure, although we haven't seen it said publicly, I'm sure that behind the scenes somewhere in Washington and where these large telecom companies are headquartered, um, there is some discussion now of how we can police it. But I'll tell you, it's not easy. No, every uh, router, every internet router on the web is a potential vulnerability, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Um, be, until we can find a way to improve the software, um, it's clear now that um, somebody with uh, bad intentions can spoof a router into thinking that it's speaking to another router that is not who it says it is. In other words, you've got routers in the U.S. who thought they were sending traffic in the U.S., and really they were sending traffic via China Telecom's network and China Telecom's routers, and it was going back to China. And such is the speed of internet traffic, it travels at just below the speed of light that you don't even notice it if you if your email arrives a second later. You you don't notice it and you know, it could be due to any other sort of congestion on the network. Yeah, I see your point here. And it really uh really is a little terrifying, but uh hey, uh you know, that's the world we're living in now and uh there's not much we can do about it, I guess, but we're probably doing the same thing to the Chinese as well, although nobody talks about that, correct? I mean, because the Internet was invented here, and we've been uh, kind of uh, monkeying with it ever since. Well, I think the big difference is, you know, there's there's national security espionage and there's corporate espionage, and I think it's... Um, I think it's fair to say that the United States practices a hell of a lot less corporate espionage than China does. And I'd say most countries in the West that we're used to do not engage in huge amounts of corporate espionage. And as you know, people in this country have been convicted and sent to jail 
for that mm-hmm. sort of corporate skullduggery. So, you know, I think we're we're a more uh, law abiding people that way. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, you can see open comments from the Chinese Communist Party leaders over the last 20 or 30 years, you know, that the Americans have an unfair advantage in technology and Chinese the Chinese loyal Chinese people, wherever they are in the world, should do whatever they can to overcome that advantage. That's an in, that's an invitation and a legitimization of corporate espionage, and and I think in this side we we try not to do that. Our laws make it clear that you shouldn't do that, and we punish people. Okay, you know there are always a few bad apples, but many of them do get punished. Yeah, well, I agree with you there, but I think we're taking everything as well. I mean, like the U.S. has uh, done economic espionage uh, for for a century, right? I mean, it's just, uh, you know, it just... Uh, well, national we security espionage, sure, we do that. And I think we do a good job at it from the little we can tell. But, uh, you know, and then there's another aspect of it, which is we're not allowed to operate the Internet in China. Mm-hmm. So... Um, you know, we, you know, we can, we can look at what they're doing over here and look at their products. And I know when I worked for a technology company, we certainly studied their products when they put them in display in a trade show in the West. But uh, what, what they do there is they, they operate their internet in a very secure fashion. Mm -hmm. When people, when they buy American internet products, they, (laughs) <laughs> they monitor them very carefully. They don't let American telecom companies or internet companies act there. I mean, you see Google is now doing backflips to try and get back into the Chinese market, agreeing to work with Chinese censors. I don't know if I approve of that, but it just shows, puts a window on how carefully they control their internal internet. And, you know, people in this country like to say, oh, it's impossible to control things. The internet is global, blah, blah, blah. Well, they've got a nation of over a billion people and they do an excellent job of controlling what gets in, what gets out. And, you know, you don't want to be searching on terms that the Chinese government disapproves of if you live in China, because you're going to get that knock on the door. So we obviously are are not and won't move to a totalitarian state, thank God. But (laughs) we, we can and should do a better job of controlling enemy forces within our internet. Yeah, we definitely should. And hopefully we'll do a better job now. Trump seems to care a great deal about this, and he gets it. And yet this is just another item on the table when dealing with China, where Trump has really put his foot down, hasn't he? Yes. I mean, he's taking an aggressive approach and saying, look, we have to fix this trading relationship, as as we've discussed before. Um, you know, we import roughly five times as much as we export to China. That can't go on. It's hurt our industries and these tariffs are having an impact. They are hurting Chinese industry. We're seeing Chinese export orders. Actually, they surged in the most recent month, but the the purchasing managers index of what's coming in the future shows decline. So the Chinese economy is suffering. We've seen Chinese companies say we're going to go open up production facilities in Vietnam and elsewhere because they see the writing on the wall that they're going to have more luck exporting to the United States from Southeast Asia than they will from China. And that's worried the Chinese economy, the Chinese government. Um, And so, you know, we are making progress. I think we're heading in the right direction there. Yeah. Hey, well, nobody else uh, has wanted to take on the task. And, uh, you know, Trump is the one. So uh, what, uh, what do you think we can look forward to here in the future? What's going to happen here? FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Egypt is on the verge once again becoming a world-renowned gold producer. The golden age is being rediscovered. For millennia, ancient Egyptian kingdoms prospered from unparalleled riches. Pharaohs built their empires and flaunted their abundant wealth that was made possible by the country's resource-rich gold deposits. Despite this rich history, modern Egypt remains one of the most underdeveloped gold mining countries in the world. Aton Resources is at the center of the modern Egyptian mining world, diligently working both as the only public ex exploration company in Egypt today and as the advocate for mining reform with the Egyptian government. 
However, those that arrive early, like Aton, will reap the best rewards. Aton's discovery of the legendary Lost Mountain of Gold at Rod Ruin and its current aggressive drilling program there could potentially reap those rewards. Aton Resources is focused on its 100% owned Abu Marawat concession in the Arabian Nubian Shield, located 200 kilometers north of Sentiment Sakari's world-class gold mine. Aton possesses first mover advantage in the underfollowed jurisdiction of Egypt, which is currently undergoing mining reform. To stay on top of Aton's latest drill results and news, go to atonresources.com. Aton trades on the TSX-V under the ticker AAN and on the OTC under the ticker ANLBF. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Well, what I'm hoping is that the tariffs set the stage for a return of certain industries to the United States of America. What I'd like to see, you know, you think of some of these industries, furniture, toys, technology, to mention three uh, three large industries that have moved wholesale to to Asia and mainly China. There's no reason why over the next five years we can't see um, production begin to restart in this country, bringing back manufacturing jobs and um, restoring prosperity and restoring some of these, you know, these technologies because there's technology in manufacturing everything. There's technology in manufacturing toys and furniture and all the rest of it. And, and we need to do that here. I think it's a giant fallacy to think we can design things here and have all the production done elsewhere. Ultimately, the design would move there too. So I'm optimistic that we're going to see progressively over the next five years production returning to the United States of America. Hey, well, hopefully you are correct from your mouth to God's ears. I mean, Trump has said uh, in his recent uh, press conference that he wants uh, immigration because there's hundreds of companies moving back here and we need the, uh, you know, we need, basically need the... uh, the employees, the staff, right? Yes, you, I mean, we do have um, we do have shortages of workers in certain industries, and um, you know, our, our coalition we don't take a position on the immigration, which is a hot button issue. I'm sure you you, you folks talk about oh, it a lot. Yeah. So I'm not going to take a position on that issue. The way I would put it is this way: um, our members are telling us that there are shortages of skilled workers in certain industries. What the fir- what we need to do first in this country is to get Americans to come back to manufacturing industry. To do that, we need to see growth in manufacturing, which we are seeing this year. We need to see more confidence return that these industries are going to be here for the long term. And then we need to see people um, training and taking vocational courses and learning about how to operate things like computer controlled machine tools and returning to those jobs. And we also need to see manufacturing wages edge up. And we're seeing just the beginning of that. We need to see more three and even 4% growth in manufacturing wages. And then Americans will become more confident that manufacturing is something that America ought to be doing. And it's the right and the best place to work for all those people, which is the majority of Americans who don't want to get a four-year college degree. And right. after we meet all those demands, then we need workers to come in from overseas to fill the gaps that still exist. Agreed. So you're basically optimistic here. Do you think we can put a lid on China on their uh, nefarious uh, misdoings, misdeeds? Well, I would say I'm, I'm optimistic that this is going to lead to that we've already, we're already seeing between three and four percent economic growth here in this country. We're seeing jobs go up. We're seeing wages start to edge up. So, as an economist, I'm optimistic about all those things, and I think economically decoupling from China is going to help this economy. Um, but when you say, can we put a lid on China's nefarious, nefarious practices? I guess um, I don't see us fundamentally changing the Chinese Communist Party, but I do see us changing how the trading relationship works. And to the extent they engage in nefarious practices, there are ways we can keep them outside of our, keep those practices outside of our borders. So that's right. what makes me optimistic. Okay. And, and there's an awareness <clears throat> and obviously a desire to do something about it. You know, Congress, you would have thought they would have been all over this. Jeff, but they just don't seem to care anything about it. 
I think, yeah, I'm disappointed in Congress. Um, they can't put together a decent trade policy to save their lives. A lot of them are uh, special interest groups. They respond to the farmers and even the farmers. We have farmers in our, in our group who who support the tariff policies, but uh, some of the agricultural lobbies are dominated by the giant meat packers who really are, are multinationals interested in importing products more than they are in seeing American production continue. So, so I'm a little disappointed in Congress on the, on the other hand, you know, I would say that when we speak to Democrats on Capitol Hill, there's growing acceptance that yes, China is a problem and something does need to be done. So let's see what happens when um, the Democrats assemble in January and we've got a new Congress. Um, and, you know, we've got Nancy Pelosi as a speaker. I'm, I'm thinking that we may see a, a quietly, um, what's the word, a cooperative approach while there'll be very loud Democrats who will criticize everything President Trump does, you know, I think the labor union members of our of our coalition are very positive on the Mexico-Canada agreement. They have influence with Democrats in Congress. So you may see some more cooperation on trade issues than we did than we have seen in the past. Interesting. Well, I think you could be right. I mean, but it seems like the Democrats don't really care about the unions anymore. They more or less care about uh, illegal aliens courting their vote, pandering to them, <laughs> whatever it takes. And you have to wonder, uh, Nancy Pelosi, not the most rational of uh, leaders, and certainly could be argued to uh, maybe having an uh, onset of uh, certain age-related uh, ailments that I hope none of us ever get. But, you know, <laughs> you just can't, and you can't trust her. Um, she's gotten super wealthy being in Congress, so she's not going to be our uh, savior on this topic for sure, but, uh, but maybe she will see the light of day. You never know. But, but she and others, so my answer is she and others are concerned about winning elections. And I think they're, I think, and I hope they're going to realize that in the, in the vast middle of this country, you know, from Pennsylvania across to Iowa, for them to win elections, they need issues that those folks respond to. And as you say, in both coasts, they'll be very loud on, on, on immigration and everything to do with identity politics. But I'm hopeful that they realize that um, Trump has struck a chord with his issues in that middle of the country, and they need to respond. So, so you know, it's a, you know, I'm no political expert. I'm just a, a humble economist so with my spreadsheets here in, in Virginia. But um, I'm hoping that they start to see that the, the the nature of the electorate forces them to become a little more realistic. Yeah. Well, they, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm just. Uh, remembering a saying by Will Rogers, uh, ignorance got us into this mess and ignorance will get us out. And that's uh, when it comes, <laughs> when it comes to ignorance, uh, Democrats seem to have no, no second, uh, do they? <laughs> well, you know, we're a bipartisan organization. We try to have good relations with, with both parties. So I'm, I'm going to, you know, stick with my position that I'm optimistic that um, that both sides in Congress will, will start to see the light and work towards a more rational trade policy because we need a better trade policy to boost um, manufacturing and incomes and wages and prosperity in this country. Well, let's let's uh, hope for the best here. Prepare for the worst. Hope for the best. Right. <laughs> right. That's what well, we need no, to do. Well, look, we're doing good right now. We got growth mm -hmm. better than three and a half percent. We got wages going up. Um, like, uh, like I say, I think we've got t tariffs on half of our Chinese imports. The other half is going to come, and um, you know, I think that's going to stimulate production in this country. I hope you're right, and certainly it's working thus far. Um, the concern is that the boost from the tax cuts is wearing off. And uh, maybe we're heading south. I don't know. I rather doubt it. Uh, I don't think it's happening. I think just a lot of uncertainty right now, economic, otherwise. Hey, Jeff, uh, so the best place to find you is obviously prosperousamerica.org. And I suggest you go there, join, check out the site, 
real interesting work that you're just not going to find anywhere else. Questions for Jeff or myself, email us, kl at kerrylutz.com. The Twitter feed is at Carrie Lutz. The Facebook page is Financial Survival Network. Jeff, thanks for coming on again. We'll talk to you again real soon. Sure, Carrie. Thanks a lot. Always good to talk to you. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.